Thank you, Ron. Good morning, everyone. What I'm presenting today is a project that we started about a year and a half ago. Uh, the objective of the project is explained on the title. I'm going to talk a little more on the background of the project, of the methodology, and the results that we obtained. Uh, we believe that the approach that we followed uh, may be applied outside the borders of Greece. Therefore, uh, we hope that this project has contributed to hydration research and is of interest to a broader audience like you are. But before I get into the details of the project, let me share a few photos with you so that we all relax. These are around uh, the words water balance because obviously these are the important on this title, not the Greek population. This is a picture from Greece, from Corfu. It's a landscape picture with lots of water around it. <coughs> Obviously, water is important. My mother is from Corfu, but uh, we do not live in Corfu. Uh, we live in Athens, so I'm going to balance this impression from this picture with a, a photo from Athens. This is from the fringe of the Parthenon. It's four men carrying water, uh, most uh, probably for a sacred ceremony. These men are from two point five thousand years ago. These girls are 2.5 years ago. These are my three daughters joined by a friend. They're going to a ceremony, a wedding actually. Um, I'm going to play a little more with the concept of balance. Balance means what is out must go in. They're out of the water. They are in the water, <laughs> actually in the waters of the Ionian Sea. You can tell that two of them are taking ballet. One is a runner. You can guess who is the one. <laughs> OK. Back to the project now. Obviously, uh, the reason that one is a nutritionist doing a project like this is that hydration is related to public health. For good effects may be derived from water, for water contributes much towards health. Who said that? Hippocrates, 400 BC, in his text on airs, waters, and places. Actually, uh, this statue, it's at the British Museum. You can visit him if you want. Uh, of course, it took a lot of effort, resources, to reach a statement from EFSA just three weeks ago that agrees that uh, water maintains physical maintains normal physical and cognitive functions. And of course, there will be more research, as Patrick very nicely showed before, and Susan identified the gaps that we have in uh, measuring hydration and giving uh, uh, cutoffs that allow us to understand what is going on in a human or in a population, many humans, that is. Susan showed this graph, and uh, I would like to show this again, because uh, it gives uh, this uh, nice uh, depiction of what goes on with hydration, uh, you hydration, how broad uh, the borders, the, the, the limits, the ranges are when you are trying to define you hydration, hyperhydration, and hypohydration. Uh, this is a very quantitative qualitative depiction. Um, let's go a little bit to see numbers. This is, uh, again, a, a, a rough quantitative depiction of the, con of the concept of hue hydration. There are some numbers there, but these are approximate numbers, because each of those components varies uh, considerably. Water losses vary according to disease, environmental conditions, and physical activity level. And to demonstrate this, I like this graph. Uh, on the vertical axis of the graph is the water that is required uh, in quarts per day for quart one liter. On the horizontal axis, it's a, a wet bulb globe temperature. This is a function that uh, incorporates environmental temperature humidity, sunshine, and the uh, speed of the wind. Um, you can see that uh, if the environmental conditions are very favorable and uh, you're just doing nothing, you may need something like half a liter a day. But if uh, you are working very, very hard and the environmental conditions are not optimal, you may need about 10 times as much. 
So uh, water needs vary widely according to environmental conditions and physical activity levels. Water intake now. This also varies according to eating and drinking habits. We know that about 20% of this water comes from solid foods and about 80% of this water comes from consumption of fluid foods and drinking water. And we like this uh, sort of pyramid depiction that shows that uh, drinking water is your primary source of water intake, but also other sources are very important. And a nutritionist has to take into account all these contributing uh, sources for water intake. Back to numbers. EFSA gave this uh, uh, statement in 2010 that uh, a woman should uh, drink about two liters, should receive two liters of water a day, and a man about two and a half liters of water a day. And Ron very nicely uh, pointed out that if you cross the Atlantic, you need about a liter more. Uh, the deviation between these two recommendations may be related to the fact that uh, they both come as adequate water intakes, not uh, uh, calculated from some kind of physiological uh, approaches, but from epidemiological approaches, because adequate intakes depict uh, the habits of a healthy population. Now, EFSA has a lot of data from Northern Europe, does not have data from Southern Europe to derive this adequate index. What's uh, special about the South of Europe, not just our economy, but also our summers <laughs> that are very, um, very hot, so maybe we need more water. And if we contribute more data in uh, the European uh, database, then uh, maybe uh, these uh, numbers may change. So having this in mind, we thought that it would be worth to um, evaluate water intake, water balance, and hydration status in a population, and of course in uh, sensitive population groups around Europe. But do we have appropriate tools for that? We need research tools for assessing water balance and hydration status, and we need accepted cutoffs to characterize new hydration. We do not have cutoffs. We have very few information or a golden standard as uh, uh, you may say, for hydration status, but we can do an, uh, a research, so we can design an approach to evaluate water balance in the population. And we developed a questionnaire, a questionnaire that allowed us to measure, evaluate, I would say, water intake from solid and fluid foods and drinking water, and also water loss from urine, feces, and sweat. Um, let me go back a little bit. Water intake is easy to measure because nutritionists do have this kind of tool uh, very well developed for many years. But what about water loss for urine, feces, and sweat? This was difficult to estimate. So what we did is that uh, we used a liquid type scale to ask people how much they feel they sweat. And we use the IPAC questionnaire, which is uh, a questionnaire that measures physical activity. And uh, uh, just to answer a little bit how you interpret these uh, uh, answers, um, this is uh, approximately how we estimated water losses through sweat. We, uh, uh, we uh, multiply the duration of exercise per intensity the score that uh, the subjects were giving, and a converting factor. What was this converting factors? These converting factors uh, derived from literature data on how much people are losing, of, of how much water people are losing through sweat per intensity of exercise. So according to the points that they gave in the liquor type scale, we used uh, any value in between and calculated approximately how much water they were losing through their sweat. A 
questionnaire like this in nutrition research has to be validated, that is to compare the results that we get from a questionnaire with some physiological indices. Of course, we run into the problem that we do not have golden standards for hydration indices, but you used a few urine indices here, and um, uh, I have put some uh, ranges the, uh, for uh, the um, uh, variability of these uh, indices in our uh, population. These are some statistics for those of you that uh, would like to see the numbers here. Uh, this statistic is uh, from uh, the Tau Kendall tests and uh, show that you have moderate agreement, which is acceptable for this kind of research, for uh, urine volume, urine color, urine osmolality, and for the three-day diaries. Therefore, we uh, consider that this is a, a questionnaire that we could go uh, further and test for its repeatability in the population. That is, if you give this questionnaire to the same people twice, do you get similar results? And uh, this is the statistics from the results of the repeatability procedure in 175 people. You see that um, uh, there is no difference between the first and the second recording. And um, this is further demonstrated in the blunt altman plots. Uh, the blunt altman Altman plots are uh, showing around the value of zero how much different uh, the two recordings are. You could see here that water balance uh, is not as good as we would like to because there is a lot of uh, points that are not around zero. And this is because the water loss points are also scattered more than we would like to. But still, water intake from solid foods, for example, is very much around zero, which is uh, uh, sort of expected because we knew that when we were doing this project that it was very, very difficult to estimate uh, water losses uh, from this kind of questionnaire. But still, these are acceptable for epidemiology, for epidemiology and nutrition research pictures and allowed us to proceed further on. And uh, what we would like to do is to estimate water balance in the general population and uh, compare what uh, happens in summer and winter in Greece. Again, going back to uh, Hippocrates, he has a very nice uh, statement here that uh, uh, whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should proceed thus, that is measure winter and summer. These are our results. These uh, plots show you the distribution of water balance in the population. And I'm repeating this uh, graph of euhydration, hyperhydration, and hypohydration to uh, remind that um, uh, we do expect in a healthy population this kind of distribution. Uh, the red lines are the 25% uh, population. Again, we would like to have cutoffs to tell you that this percent is hyperhydrated, this percent is hypohydrated, and this percent is fine. But we cannot, unfortunately, do that. But we can compare uh, these graphs between summer and winter. These are the results for summer. Uh, what you cannot see, because the graphs are not side by side, is that in winter, we have more people around the zero balance, and in summer, we have more people deviating from this zero balance. And if you go into statistics again, we did that. Uh, we divided the winter sample in, the f in four parts, the 25 quartiles, the, the, the four quartiles, and then we used those cutoffs to study our summer sample. And what we saw was that in the summer sample, we have more people in the dehydrated category, and we have more people in the hyperhydrated category. About 8% more are in the two extremes. And this is in agreement with uh, uh, the observation that in summer, we lose about 40% more water, so it is 
more difficult to uh, uh, replace this water. And maybe it is related to what we were discussing before about uh, the uh, importance of thirst in regulating our water intake. Because as Susan said, thirst may be not a very good indicator. And maybe people felt that they should drink more water. They've, therefore, they are in the hyperhydrated category more. And this uh, summarizes what just said. Understanding what are the water sources of uh, our population, we uh, are showing these uh, two pie charts. The red part in uh, the upper uh, pie is uh, drinking water. More people are receiving their water in summer from drinking plain water than in winter. And if you go in the two lower pies, these are showing uh, the contribution of various uh, sources of water that are not drinking water. They are fluid foods. You can see in Greece that we're receiving most of our water from coffee and alcoholic drinks. <laughs> But uh, uh, another important finding that I need uh, to stress out here is that uh, in this population, which was about 1,000 people, about 20% of women received less water than the recommended from EFSA, and about 30% of men received less water than the recommended. Though of course, uh, when we went to, to the question, do you know how much EFSA is recommended, only 10% got it right. So uh, I believe that um, this uh, is uh, a finding that uh, should uh, give us a little bit more concern. Uh, we do not have too many uh, data in uh, Europe. These are results from the Seneca study uh, that show that uh, most of the elderly people receive below than uh, the recommended EFSA intake. This is below the 2 uh, and 2.5 uh, recommended liters. This is uh, the 1.7 recommended intake. Therefore, I think that uh, an organization like the European Hydration Institute uh, uh, has the tools uh, that uh, would allow people to learn more and adopt uh, a lifestyle that uh, takes care of the hydration needs. and by finishing this presentation. I would like to thank the research group. It's uh, three nutritionists, Olga, Antonis, and myself, two statisticians, uh, and uh, our external advisor, Susan, who contributed much to our learning when we were setting up the questionnaire. And uh, beyond our research group is our uh, sponsors, the Coca-Cola from Greece, which we also thank. <laughs>